the Pulmonary Journal Club. Um, my talk today is going to be on the GAP index. Um, pretty much my outline is pretty simple. I'm just going to talk about the um, IPF and then we're going to talk about staging systems pretty much as defined by the GAP index. Um, I have no financial disclosures. So we're pretty much starting to talk about IPF. So IPF is defined as a chronic form of fibrosing interstitial pneumonia of unknown etiology. Um, it pretty much occurs in older adults, is limit, is limited to the lung, and it has a significant histopathological and radio radiological pattern of UIP. Um, it pretty much, to, to diagnose somebody with um, IPF, you pretty much have to exclude other forms of interstitial pneumonia, including IODs from like environmental exposures, medication, or systemic diseases. The incidence. Um, there's no large-scale studies on the incidence or prevalence of IPF um, to form pretty much these um, estimates, but they did have some studies from the UK, and they had the overall in incidence of um, 4.6 per 100,000 person years. Um, in the United States, when they looked at the database from healthcare claims, they pretty much estimated the incidence of IPF to be 6 to um, 16 um, per 100,000 person years. Um, as far as the uh, histopathological features, um, if you look at a histopathological uh, slide of uh, IPF, you'll see that it ha there have alternating um, areas of normal lungs and interstitial inflammation. And then you see this uh, fibrotic zone, which is pretty much um, composed of dense collagen, and it's pretty much uh, surrounded by fibroblasts and myelofibroblasts, which pretty much lays this dense, fibro um, dense collagen around, which pretty much causes this uh, dense fibrosis. You also see honeycomb changes, which is pretty much uh, airways filled with this dense um, collagen around it, and it's pretty much filled with uh, mucin and inflammatory cells. Um, this histopathological changes really affects the subpleural and the paraseptal parenchymal, and that's where it's mostly severe at. Um, pretty much what we're talking about, um, as you can see, you see the honeycomb in. It's not working. But you see the honeycomb, and pretty much you see that cystic airspace, is, like we said, is filled with mucin and inflammatory cells. And you see the dense, pretty much call it, um, dense fibrosis that's around that. Um, and then you see the fibroblast focus. And when you magnify that, that, that fibroblast focus is pretty much uh, your myelofibroblast and your fibroblast that's laying down this framework of, of collagen. And you can compare that to normal alveoli on the left of this slide to see just the comparison. And like we said, um, it has a he heterogeneity kind of pattern, so you see alternating levels of normal and densely um, infl inflammatory <coughs> process. So you see normal, normal tissue, and then you see like densely um, fibrotic tissue. UIP pattern. So um, HRCT is essential in when you're trying to diagnose IPF. Um, the presence of reticular abnormalities um, um, are also is often associated with tra traction bronchiectasis, and you also see honeycomb, which is pretty common and is critical for making a definitive diagnosis. And this honeycomb is usually subpleural. Um, you tend to see mild ground glass um, also, but it's not as bad as the reticulation that you see, and the distribution of this tends to be more basal and peripheral, um, and it's also sometimes patchy. You can see mediastinal adenopathy, um, they're usually less than 1.2 from at least the ATS guidelines saying that it's usually less than 1.2, so mediastinal adenopathy is not uncommon. And as we can see, we can see this uh, pretty much a uh, pattern. As you see, you have the base, the basilar and the peripheral honeycombing that you see. You see the dense reticulation also uh, on the slide. That's pretty much indicative of um, IPF. Um, so you have this uh, also thing of possible UIP. So if you have somebody who has this dense reticulation and they don't have honeycomb in, honeycomb in is absent, um, but they also but they still meet the criteria for UIP, then you can pretty much say that this is possible UIP. But in this scenario, to make a definitive diagnosis, you at least need to have a surgical lung biopsy. Um, so, and also, people who do not demonstrate a UIP pattern, at least on a, um, HRCT, may still have a surgical lung biopsy that has a UIP pattern, so they still may have um, um, UIP. So of course, like we said, the diagnosis, you pretty much have to exclude other etiologies for ILD. So whether it's uh, occupational, uh, environmental exposures, connective tissue disease, drug toxicity. Um, you also, and when you're looking at HRC, having a, a, a pattern of UIP pattern on HRCT is sufficient to diagnose that. 
and that's because um, they did studies where they looked at um, histo histopathological diagnosis of UIP and HRCT, and they found that people who had a higher people who had the the, the, the distribution and the pattern of of um, UIP on HRCT had a high sensitivity, ha had a high specificity of having UIP. So that's why they came to the conclusion that people who pretty much have this kind of pattern on HRCT do not need a, lung, a surgical lung biopsy to diagnose that since the specificity of it is so high. Um, and then also if you have the combination of the pattern on the HRCT plus a surgical lung biopsy, of course, then you can diagnose some IPF. And this is pretty much a um, kind of a combination of histopathological plus radiological findings to pretty much diagnose it. Of course, if you have the HRC, HRCT pattern, um, plus you have surgical lung biopsy, you can diagnose IPF. Um, if you have probable, meaning that you have some features of um, IPF, but you still have a um, HRC pattern of it, then you can still diagnose it. If you have possible pattern on HRCT, and you have probable pattern on surgical lung biopsy that you can still diagnose it. So there's a, uh, there's a lot of things that you have to take into context, both radiologically and histopathologically, to pretty much diagnose some IPF. So the natural history of um, IPF. You have a, it's a progressive decline um, in subjective and objective pulmonary functions. Um, when they looked at retrospective longitudinal studies, they seen that the median survival time when somebody diagnosed from the time of diagnosis of IPF was two to three years from the time of diagnosis. But there's considerable variability, um, and that ranged from 27 months when people were severe, which was defined at an FEC less than 55% predicted, to 50, 55 months to patients with mild disease, which is considered a FEC greater than 70% predicted. Um, and some of these stuff, and these were just based off of studies in the past for risk of um, mortality with people who have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So your level of dyspnea at baseline, um, if your DLCO was less than 40% predicted, if you desaturated less than 88% on a six minute walk, um, the extent of honeycombing, so sometimes you'll see people get repeat um, HRCTs, and if their honeycombing was um, more than you said, they have an increased risk of mortality. Pulmonary hypertension, um, some longitudinal factors like if their level of dyspnea increased or if their um, FEC increased by 10% from the absolute value on, um, in baseline, if that increased by 10% or, the, or their DLCO increased by 50%, these also were um, risk factors for mortality in people who had IPF. Um, so there's different kind of phenotypes for IPF. There were several possible natural histories of people with IPF. So you have some people who are just be stable. So they, you diagnose them with IPF, but their clinical course, they tend to remain stable. The majority of people, you start seeing this slow progression. So you start seeing that there's a steady decline uh, in, in their um, functional status. So you start seeing um, gradually over the years, they start to progress worse. And then you have, of course, your rapid progressions. So maybe they have an acute exacerbation um, and then their, they, and their time to mortality is a lot quicker. Because of the he heterogeneity of people with IPF, um, um, there was a hard time in predicting prognosis with people who have IPF. Are you going to be the rapid person? Or are you going to be the stable person? Thus, predicting patients with IPF was a challenge for a lot of clinicians. clinicians. Um, so there, there came, so they thought, okay, maybe using a staging system with people with IPF may accurately inform prognosis and help guide clinical decision makings and allow for like a, appropriate life planning process. And that's where this study came from, the multi-dimensional index of staging system for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so the objective of this study was to, die, to develop a prognostic staging system for people with IPF you, using common measured um, clinical and physiological variables that you can see when somebody comes to your clinic. Um, and the reason they, that, that was important is that when they had previous studies, they had stuff that were not commonly available to clinicians. So if somebody came into your clinic at, at that time, if you have, what could you look at to see would this person have a higher chance of, of death from their IPF or not? Um, so the funding, of course, of was from the University of California, San Francisco, their Clinical and Translational Science um, Institute. They provided funding for the trial, but they uh, pretty much put in bold letters that they had no role in the study design, analysis, or interpretation of the trial. So the study itself, 
they evaluated um, 228 patients um, that were enrolled in the University of Cal um, San Fran Interstitial Lung Program as a, in a longitudinal cohort between um, 2001 and 2010. And the validation cohort was, was taken at uh, Mayo Clinic and um, Morgani Hospital in and, and, um, Italy. Um, and that was also around the same time period between 2000 and 2010. Um, and a diagnosis, uh, they have to have a diagnosis of IPF according to the established criteria at the time, which was like, um, at that time was the ATS, which they had the first little, uh, the first uh, criteria was published in 2000. Um, and they had to have PFT that was at least available within six months of the initial clinic visit. Um, so they looked at predictors. Um, the predictor variables were considered if they were commonly measured and available at the time of initial consultation. And they included age, sex, um, their BMI, their smoking status, and they compared those who's, who ever smoked to those who never smoked, their FEVC and their FEV1, total lung capacity, and their DLCO. When available, um, corrected for hemoglobin. They also had oxygen, but they removed it out because it was too much heterogeneity in, in the study. Screening, um, so they used model screening selected for, so they had model screenings um, to look at which, which, of the, which of these variables had the highest risk of being something that had increased in mortality. So they had model screenings using some of these formulas, and they came up with the four best predictors of um, which they included into the gap calculator was, which was a gender, age, and two physiological variables, which um, was FAVC and DLCO. Mm -hmm. um, as we can see, when we looked at the continuous uh, model at, in the combined co cohorts, when they looked at the de um, de derivation cohort and the validation cohort, and they combined them, and you can see that the uh, male sex had a hazard ratio of 1.4. Age and physiology, uh, and the physiology. If you look at the FEC and the um, the DSEO, they also pretty much um, had a pretty significant high um, hazard ratio. The data. There were various statistical maneuvers that were used to create um, this continuous model, which was updated using coefficients and cumulative distribution, uh, subdistribution hazards based on a combined cohort to yield most general generalizable estimates for clinical interpretation. Um, pretty much that's layman's term saying they created a model and they used coefficients. So they looked at the strength between um, variables, between two variables. And then they looked at the cumulative sub subdistribution hazard, so the cumulative force. So they looked at, um, in this cohort, cohort the cumulative force, um, if mortality, when they looked at, when they put in this data, if mortality was still significant on repeatable processes. And the primary outcome, the primary outcome, of course, is mortality. Um, the prediction of mortality was based on a fine grade model for survival, um, treating transportation as a competing risk. And, and that's important because when you, they could not use a Kaplan-Meier because a Kaplan-Meier, you have stuff like, a, it would be a regression to mortality. And when you look at stuff like mortality, you have um, a competing risk and something like transplant. So people who, in this, in this study, if you just looked at mortality, people who got transplanted may affect their data, so you can't use that as a data endpoint. So you have to just try to uh, assess that by using a different kind of model. And the fine grade model actually assesses four um, competing risks. So transplantation would be another competing risk. So they'll look at people up to transplantation, uh, up to, they'll look at transplantation as a competing risk and look at mortality if before transplantation. So that's why they use the fine grade model for um, looking at survival um, and, not, and not the um, Kaplan-Meier curve. And if you look at the patient characteristics, most of the patients were male. Um, um, most of them um, smoked. They're BMI, they were not um, obese. Um, a lot of them had, were at least a, a significant had oxygen use. Um, the FEVC1, of course, was not too bad, 68% predicted in the, um, and both cor cohorts. Um, uh, what was significant, if you look at um, the treatment used, the validation cohort that significant more patients that were treated with uh, prednisone um, than the, the derivation cohort. Um, and categories. So each predictor was divided into categories. Each category was divided, was assigned into one to three points. Um, and then finally, after they did that, they made a staging system, which was made up of grouping points into three groups. Um, the group Stage one 
which comprises of the lowest, uh, the 40% lowest estimated risk of death, stage two was comprised of um, f the next, compromise of 40% of the next intermediate risk, and stage three, of course, was 20% of the highest risk. And these risks pretty much correlated to one year mortality of 10%, estimated mortality of 10%, um, 10 to 30%, and 30% respectively. So, um, so looking at uh, the pretty much the staging system that we're talking about, they of course defined it as the gap. And when they looked at the gender, um, given one point for male, none for females, um, and this is all, all we say because of the model that they looked at to look at um, multivariate risk and seeing which risk was more associated with uh, increasing mortality. They looked at males. Males was given one point. Um, having an age greater than 65 was given two points. Um, and as far as physiology, having a, um, a FEVC predicted less than 50% was given two points, and having a DLCO less than 35% was given two points. And if they could not perform the procedure, um, either because um, of their respiratory status or, or whatnot, they was given three points. The max point that you can get was eight. And they, of course, divided it, like we said, into stages, and then they subdivided the point into the stage for each one. So one Stage one was uh, was points between zero and three. Stage two was between four and five, and stage three was between six and seven. And then they um, estimated the mortality at this point um, at one year, five point five point uh, six percent one year mortality for people with stage one. Um, stage two at one year. Um, was, uh, I mean, at two years was 10.9, and stage three at um, at uh, three years was uh, was 16.3. Um, so pretty much they just pretty much uh, took all of the data and put it into stages and gave it points and then looked at the mortality according to age and to stages and then um, plotted it on a chart. Um, and then these are some of the predictors and some of the uh, um, immortality and of some people who got plotted up. As we can see, male had a hazard ratio of one. Um, it was given one point. Um, age was given, had a hazard ratio of 1.5, um, was, was greater than 65. We assigned FEVC was, uh, was um, if it was less than 50, had a hazard ratio of 4.2. Um, baseline DLCO, if it was unable to, pre um, unable to perform, had a hazard ratio of 9.5. Um, and the change in FEVC, if it was less than 10, have a ratio of uh, 3.6, and it was uh, um, between 10 and minus 5, have a ratio of actually less. Um, this brings uh, to the model for performance on the gap index. So um, pretty much when they looked at the derivation cohort and the validation cohort and they combined it, um, we can see from right here that um, at the one-year mortality of stage one, your, the predicted was uh, 5.6, what observed was 4.8. So 4.8 people with stage one had a um, 4.8 chance of mortality. People with stage two um, at one year had a 17.2%, and people with stage three had a 40.5% um, chance of mortality at one year. Of course, um, as uh, the years got more, their increased risk of mortality increased. So people with stage one at two years had an increased risk of 10.5. Um, at stage two, they had 33.3. At stage three, they had 67.1. Um, and at three years, of course, it was really substantial. Stage one, 21%. Stage two, 47.7%. And stage three, 74.4%. Um, and this is pretty much looking at um, uh, the gap index, and they pretty much uh, uh, graphed it. And you can see, as from mortality, which is the uh, graphical representation of what we just said. As you know, as the years got on, um, they, they had an increased risk of mortality, especially stage three as composed of stage two and stage one. Um, so we can see that in stage one, people had a, a relative low risk of death in the first three years, six, 10, 11, and 16 percent respectively, and they're less likely to gain a short-term survival advantage from lung transportation. Um, people with stage two, they had an in intermediate risk. So, so people who had stage two in their um, first three years, 16, 29, and 42 percent respectively, these people should at least begin the transplant process and could benefit from clinical trials that may slow the progression of their disease. People with stage three, of course, have the highest risk of death within the first three years, 40 percent, um, 60, 72, or 76 percent respectively. 
And these people should urgently be referred to a transplant center. And if they're not transplant candidates at the time, they should at least be, the discussion should at least revolve around early end of life planning and symptom management. Some of the limitations, if patients of symptoms or lung function have prohibited performance of the DLCO maneuver, they were scored as unable to perform um, in the category of the DLCO. And um, because of how they get the data, the model cannot be applied to people who have a DLCO um, results that are not available at the time. So, um, so not available for, so people, you can't really use a gap study if you cannot really uh, perform a DLCO in these patients. It is also limited by the inability to assess the disease progression. So if you take it like this, a patient has a GAP score of four. From the study, we know that they, that um, a GAP score of four, one out of three patients will die in two years. Their estimated mortality is 33%. But we don't know what's the functional decline in their, in, in their functional status. Will they progress to stage three? Will they stay at stage two? Will they be stable at that stage? We don't know. All we know is that in one year, they have a mortality of 33%. So we know that one out of uh, one out of the, the three people will die, but we don't know who will progress to becoming worse, who will stay the same. So that's one of the limitations of the study. Um, so currently, disease progression was monitored is being monitored with serial PFTs. I look at a 10% increase in the forced vital capacity over 10 to 12 months, and a decline in diffusion capacity for the lung um, carbon monoxide gradient of 15%. And um, we have a gap calculator online in the ACP you can access it right here, and this is pretty much what we're looking at, what we just talked about. Um, and that led to the second study, pretty much. Um, they wanted to say, okay, since we know that the estimated mortality for people with, um, from the gap index is um, what we already talked about, could we predict a future states of decline um, by, um, can we predict future states of decline from their GAP index. So they came out with a study that was just published last, last month in February in CHESS. Um, and so the objective is that it's unknown whether clinical staging predicts future decline in pulmonary function. The goal was to assess whether the GAP stage predicts future pulmonary function decline, whether interval pulmonary function change predicts mortality after accounting for stage. They, ha they hypothesized that subjects with more advanced disease as defined according to a higher GAP stage would experience a more rapid decline and pulmonary function with a greater yearly decrement in the FEVC, FEVC and DLCO. So people who had a higher, high, higher gap stage, they should, their, their rate of lung decline should be um, r more rapid uh, and clinic clinically and statistically significant. That was their um, hypothesis. So their method, they identified patients with IPF, um, of course, according to the results of a biopsy or CT scan. And they looked at patients from um, the Royal Brumpton Hospital and Harefield National Health Science um, Foundation um, and the University of Michigan. And they looked at patients from 1981 to 2008, plus retrospective study. Um, each patient was, each, each patient's age, sex, um, age, sex, and uh, PFTs were obtained. And the patients who had a missing um, DLCO at, at baseline were ex excluded. Um, predictors. Uh, so, of course, uh, the predictors of variables were pretty much included their baseline gap stage, um, and they calculated the, as calculated before from the previous gap study. Um, and um, their primary outcome, of course, was an absolute change in the, and relative change from baseline of their SVC and their DLCO, as well as a transplant free, free survival period. Um, as defined as the absence of death or lung transplantation during follow-up measure from the date of initial PFT. So when they first got their PFTs, um, well, how, what's the percentage of people that uh, pretty much um, had a transplantation-free period or um, did not go undergo transplantation or, or death? So it's a statistical method. Um, they looked at um, their characteristics were pretty much gas stage one, two, or three. Um, their mean was, their, was from the standard deviation used for the continuous variable. So they looked at the quantitative variables and they used uh, the means and the standard deviations um, and that was used for the continuous variables. And then percentage points were used for so like people's um, gender, stuff like that, they, which were um, categorical variables. They used percentage points to, to define those. Um, um, statistical difference between um, gas stage for continuous assessment using 
the analysis of variance and um, statistical difference between the gap stage was used the chi-square method. Um, so pretty much um, the analysis of variance, they looked at um, if there's variance between the data charts and there's there variance between the different groups of the, the data charts. And that's good for quantitative variables like um, um, numbers, anything like with numbers, you want to use an analysis of variance because it's good at looking at quantitative data points. But the Pearson's chi-square is looked at, it's good at looking at uh, categorical variables because so stuff like age and stuff like that, which is not, but you wouldn't want to use an analysis analysis of variance for that. You want to use something like a chi-square that can, which would be a better method of like an, analyzing that data for categor categorical variables. So the patients, um, they had 74, 734 patients that were initially identified. 657 of those did not have um, baseline FPVCs or DLCOs. Um, at, at baseline when they were seen, so they were excluded from the study. And 412 were assessed with a multivariable an analysis cohort um, because uh, out of those 657, of course, six, um, 18 died six months before, um, not dead, but uh, the FVC or the DLCO was not within the first six months, so 213 was excluded from that. And then people whose um, FVC or, or their um, DLCO was missing, 14 were also excluded from the study, so at the end of the day they had uh, 412. Out of the study, 70%, majority of them were male, um, majority of them of course were older, um, 62, year, 62, year, 62 years old, and the mean FVC was 68% uh, predicted and the DLCO was 45% predicted. And this was the uh, baseline characteristics of the patients, like we already talked about, the age there were significantly older um, patients, most majority of them were male, and um, their FEVC were, um, predicted was, uh, as I said, 68, and the DLCO was uh, 45, plus or minus. And then when you start looking at, of course, uh, when they categorize them into their gap stages, um, of course, uh, when you look at their um, PFTs, the uh, FEVC was lower of, uh, with the higher gap stage, which we, as which we expect, and their DLCO, of course, was also lower as according to the higher gap stage. Um, and uh, so right here we're looking at the survival for years and we're looking at, of course, their, um, their gas stages and plotting them on, on, uh, on years. And as we already um, found out from the previous study that uh, people with a higher gas stage have a higher risk of mortality. So this is just pretty much saying that. Um, and, and, they, and when they have to censor that, they have to censor some of this data because uh, of, of course, of the, um, what they call, um, the I'm try the words. Competing risk. Sorry. Sorry. They have competing risk. So they have to censor some of these data so the data would not be biased. Um, so when you look at the relative change in the FEC from baseline, um, uh, you looked at a, so we saw the FEV for gap one at six months, there was a change of um, 4.17. Um, at 12 months, 7.1, um, at 18 months, 11.4, and at 24 months, 13.7. But if you look at the p-values for all these, none of these were significant. And this was also looked at when you looked at the gap stage 2, gap stage 3. Um, there was significant change in the FVC from baseline at 6 months to 24 months, but none of the values were significant across the charts. This is also seen when you looked at the, um, the relative change from the DSCO from baseline so you had, they definitely had um, their, their DSCO definitely decreased and there was a change at least from baseline. But of course, when you looked at from gap stage one to gap stage three, there was none of these was considered um, statistically significant. So um, both the change in the DSCO and FEC was um, deemed um, um, not, not statistically significant, so no change um, in their relative change from baseline of either one of these variables. Um, pretty much uh, they plotted these on a chart and pretty much we still see, that, like we just talked about, the percent change from baseline. So baseline is, of course, when they came into the clinic and came into the office and they cha they looked at, uh, they trended that um, over the, the next two years. And we, although we do see uh, a decrease in the FEVC and the next trend in their DSEO, uh, this was not cl considered clinically, statistically significant. So it was um, no, the change in their percent FEVC um, there was, was not clinically statistically significant.
necessary. Um, and like we said, the same thing can be said about the, the percent change from their DLCO. Um, this was not, even though we see a decline in their DLCO over the years, um, it was not statistically significant. So, so no change. So although pulmonary function variables are predictors of subsequent mortality, um, they do not significantly predict subsequent pulmonary function uh, trajectory. So uh, we know that we can use all this data to pretty much say that people who have a higher gas score have a higher risk of mortality at this time, but we cannot use that to, tr to pretty much say, okay, we expect these people with a higher gas score to also so sub sub subsequently also have a, um, a decrease in their FUVC or their DLCO. So their pulmonary function does not actually correlate to their gas score. Um, limitations, of course, is that a retrospective study it was taken from a referral center. So did these patients, since they were taken from a referral center, um, did these patients already have a steep decline in their lung function before being referred to these patients, these places? Also, they took data, retrospective data from 1981 to 2008. Um, the ATS first guideline was published in 2000, so there could be some confounders where some of these patients may not actually have IPF and may have some other diseases because of the database they took it from. Missing example, but thought I had questions. Come on.